Good afternoon. Thank you for taking some time to be with us today uh, to take a look at the uh, global accessibility awareness and talk about the topics impacting uh, city of Minneapolis and our residents. Want you to know that uh, this session is being recorded. Um, the chat and the Q&A will not be included in that recording. We'd like you to par participate in those areas um, to engage with the other participants in this session and uh, raise up your questions. We have somebody monitoring the QA uh, and we'll be responding to those throughout a couple strategically placed QA um, points throughout the presentation. To get things started, we want you to think of uh, a time that you have felt left out. Um, maybe even uh, felt alone in a crowd when everybody else was was having fun. Um, this this may be, this makes me reflect on uh, last spring um, in response to the pandemic. I was working with Minneapolis Public Schools at the time, and I was responsible for the distribution of devices to students who were in need uh, and, and participating in distance learning at the time. I was shocked that in, in the beginning, uh, we anticipated that there was about 2,000 students that were, were going to be in need of, of devices that we were going to have to serve. And by the time um, the distribution was complete, we had distributed over 18,000 devices. Um, so the the need and and really the broadness of of need in our community was really brought to light. Um, so some sometimes need goes unknown. So thinking about that, um, just reflect on on a point in your life where you or or someone you know may have been limited access to something, and uh, want you to think about how that impacts. Uh, the people around you. There is uh, approximately a billion people, 15% of our of our population, um, with some sort of disability, um, whether that's cognitive, uh, vision, auditory, whatever it may be, um, and about half of those people. Are, are trying to access online or digital resources. So we're talking um, about a half a billion people that we're trying to address with the topics we're discussing today. To give it some some context here, this is this is a big issue and uh, we're trying to plan for that uh, accordingly with our work. Um, it, it should impact everything we do on a day on a daily basis. The common disabilities and impairments that we're we're looking at are are visual, auditory, motor, and cognitive. So people with a visual impairment may need a, a screen reader. Uh, auditory needs, you know, you may may need to address with uh, with um, your captioning for for uh, video presentations. Um, Motor impairments may need an uh, alternative to keyboard and mouse. Um, cognitive, you, you may need to think about how you're designing uh, your screens. So today, besides myself here, Dana Naibo, I'm the director of the collaboration team in IT services for the city of Minneapolis. Um, I'm coming to you with uh, 25 years of, of web and interactive design, and I also lead the uh, city's partnership with Hennepin County and Minneapolis Public School addressing digital equity in the city of Minneapolis. Um, I want to introduce or or allow the team to introduce themselves here. So Amber. Hi everyone, my name is Amber James. I am an accessibility content strategist at Twitter on the accessibility experience team. I'm um, looking at my two bullet points here. 
I have um, uh, the International Association of Accessibility Professional Certification, also known as IAAP. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. I live in St. Paul, and I think um, I'll get deeper into my background later when I'm doing my presentation. Dana, or would you like me to go deeper now? We'll, we'll give you a chance to go deeper when you uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Amber. Sounds good. And uh, thank you for pointing out pronouns. I, my pronouns are he, him as well. Um, next team members, Karen, would you like to speak up to the group? Sure. Hi, my name is Karen Mo. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the Deputy Director at Neighborhood and Community Relations. I've worked at the city of Minneapolis since 2016, and I uh, came here so that we could make some changes inside the city. Thank you. And we also have Lynn Fig with the IT team. Lynn? Lynn, are you able to do your introduction? Hi, everybody. Welcome. Glad you're all here. I have a master's uh, degree in education and website development. I've been in this space for 20 years, and I'm here to help explain how we can make our web content accessible. Thanks. Thank you. Um, our agenda today, we'll have uh, Amber start out and uh, do a little demonstration with uh, some accessible technology. Um, some of you may not have seen these tools in use. Um, it's really great to see. Uh, we have Karen talking about, uh, from the, the NCR perspective, uh, accessibility services and support uh, in the city of Minneapolis. And Lynn is going to discuss the IT tools and resources um, we're, we're using here in the city of Minneapolis. And uh, we'll wrap it up with uh, a larger Q&A for, for, the, for the group to discuss at the end here. So Amber, if you'd like to get started, you can share your screen at this point. Sure, uh, I'll talk for a little bit first. Uh, so um, just a little bit more about me uh, working at Twitter. I work with a team of accessibility professionals from different backgrounds. Most of them are engineers. Uh, I'm the only content person. Uh, there's also a designer and a researcher who's working on the team. Um, we and what we do at Twitter is we uh, are on the product side, so we work to improve the Twitter app for everyone and make it accessible. Uh, we also partner with um, our internal teams to make sure that our processes and culture are thinking about accessibility from the beginning. And uh, as, as I'm sure the city team knows, uh, shifting to think about accessibility as early as possible does require a lot of work. Um, it does require a lot of conversations and partnership with different departments and leaders around an organization. So that's um, that's part of what of what my team does. My my background is uh, in marketing, copywriting, and content strategy. So having uh, an accessibility content strategist is kind of rare. Um, I've not met anyone else who who does this kind of work, um, at least not with the title. Uh, it's usually engineers and designers who are tasked with making content, digital content accessible. And uh, they're very good at it, uh, but it's great to have folks who are focused though on the content, uh, who are focused on hierarchy, language. Um, if you all have been in trainings with Lynn before, I'm sure she's talked to you about plain language and the importance of uh, reading level, making sure that um, the content uh, that's on the city site is accessible to everyone regardless of their level of education and language ability. Um, prior to working at Twitter, I, I worked at a design agency 
and then I was at US Bank um, as an accessibility consultant working with, um, as an embedded consultant working with design teams. So helping designers, experienced architects, writers, uh, project managers um, understand the importance of accessibility and um, the implications for uh, considering it late uh, as opposed to prioritizing it early. So the, the screen reader demonstration um, that I'm, I want to share with you is on the JAWS screen reader, um, J-A-W-S. And my understanding is that you all have access to JAWS and NVDA perhaps. Um, JAWS is the number two used uh, PC screen reader, but just barely number two. It's been number one for a very long time, um, but NVDA recently edged them out, I believe. Um, NVDA is a free screen reader while, while JAWS requires a license, so that could be part of um, why NVDA is being adopted more. So what I wanted to show you uh, related to uh, JAWS screen reader is how folks who use assistive technology, screen reader specifically, might navigate through a web page. I'm a non-disabled person, um, but I think uh, Dana Hetwoltz will talk later about um, how those of us who don't have a disability today, uh, that is a temporary situation. We're all in temporarily abled bodies. Um, as we age, you know, as we have more life experiences, accidents, uh, illness, things like that, um, we will be experiencing disability at some point. So it's really, it's really interesting to think about uh, the multi, the multimodal experience for people who come to the city site um, or use any digital product. So um, if somebody can't see, how else might they be able to access information? If they can't use a mouse or a trackpad, how else might they be able to access information and navigate a site? So I'm going to use the city website uh, as, as an example here. So I will share my screen. Screen sharing toolbar screen. Okay, so let me know if you can't hear the screen reader because that will be important for us here. So, how do we navigate a website or an article online? Do we read it top to bottom, left to right completely? Probably not. Uh, data suggests that uh, we tend to read in an F pattern, so we'll go from um, maybe we'll read the title of, of an article and then maybe the next line and the next, but then we start to skim, right? Then we start to skip around and look for information that maybe is interesting or that we are more, in, that, we're, that we're trying to find. Um, thinking about the city site, for example, folks come to your site looking for specific information probably, right? Like how do I pay my utility bill? Um, what's the latest news, uh, you know, happening in the city, things like that. Rarely do, rarely do we read everything on a page. We're looking for something specific. And folks who use assistive technology do the same thing. They skip around, they use shortcuts, they're, they use quick keys, um, they're rarely going top to bottom. And so one of the ways to navigate with the screen reader is um, a tab, for example. And forgive me if you've already had some screen reader education um, we'll try to we'll try to make it a little more useful uh, than than a one on one. So here I am on the city site. Use virtual PC cursor on https colon slash slash www.minneapolis.gov dash Google Chrome banner region. Visited link graphic Minneapolis city of navigation region. Skip navigation same. I'm using the tab key right now to navigate through and what the tab key does is it will focus on all of the interactive elements on the page. So everything you can click on or click into tab will find. Skip to 311 help same page link banner region utility navigation region list sit em up link. It pronounces sitemap in a funny way sit em up. News link record an issue link Minneapolis city of late's logo link graphic menu resident services. So that's using the tab key. Another way to go through content is with arrow keys, the up down arrow keys or left right arrow keys, depending on the screen reader you're using. And what that does is it will focus on absolutely everything. So if I keep using tab, for example, uh, it won't it won't read content. For 
Well, let's skip through the navigation here quick. Government, leaving menus, main region, search editor required invalid. It went from government uh, in the navigation right to the edit field for the search box. It totally skipped. What can we help you find today? So if I wanted to hear everything, I would use my arrow keys. Search button. Blank edit request search. Heading level one. What can we help you find today? Search blank edit search button. Heading level two. I want to visit it. Heading level three. Link movement. Link see how you're improving public safety. And heading level three. Link participate. We'll focus on everything on the page and it will read it to me. Um, and you'll notice that it skipped these icons here, and that's because these icons are decorative and they're hidden from assistive technology users because the information in those icons is non-essential, right? It's just, you know, a cute heart inside of a inside of a house. That is not critical information for somebody using assistive technology to navigate the site and find what they're looking for. So that's tab and then those are arrow keys. Also keep in mind if you're doing any testing, if you are um, having a screen reader read your content just to make sure it says what you want it to say, it's, inter it's interacting with your content in the way you expect it to, know that you're using a screen reader as somebody who doesn't use a screen reader every day. And so your experience of a screen reader will be maybe a little stilted. Uh, the, the, you'll notice that the speed of the voice that we have here is relatively slow, right? It's easy to understand. Folks who are native screen reader users will speed it up quite rapidly. Um, I've I've heard I've heard folks who are native screen reader users. Um, I've heard their screen reader, and it's it's almost unintelligible to me. Like I can't understand what it's saying because it's speaking so quickly. But they are used to this, right? Like in order for them, assistive technology users to find information that they need, they often have to listen to everything or listen to more. Uh, than folks uh, skim, so they want to get through it rapidly. So keep in mind that you're using a screen reader as someone who doesn't use a screen reader and doesn't know how to use it well. I am included in this group. I have my I have my quick keys. I have my my little uh, cheat sheet here of of shortcuts and things to use um, to make sure I'm I'm hitting all all the high points. So we use tab and arrow keys. There are also shortcut keys. For example. Um, Again, like the way the way screen reader users skip around on content, they can search by headings, region. If they're in a table, you know, they can search by buttons and things. So right now I'm going to press the H key because I just want to hear headings. Tell me what all the headings are on this page so I can get an understanding of what information is here and available to me and maybe what I want to learn more about. So I'm going to click the H key here. Find COVID-19 information heading level three link. Watch city council TV heading level three link. City officials and departments heading level two. Mayor's office heading level three. And you can hear it giving you the, the level of the heading. So level two, level three. That is the nesting structure of headings. So what it's telling me is that under heading level two, which was city officials and departments heading level two. City officials and departments. So as I move through this, the headings, I'll understand, oh, mayor's office, right? That is part of city officials and departments. City council, that is an example of city officials and departments. So by including heading levels, we are helping assistive technology users basically construct a page uh, without necessarily being able to see it. Um, also keep in mind that um, assistive technology users aren't necessarily only people who uh, are blind or have low vision. Um, I know some folks who have reading disabilities, uh, dyslexia, uh, that using a screen reader helps them navigate a site. And you can see the focus, the focus indicator here, the red box, sorry, the red box around city officials and departments. Um, Mayor's office, more options button menu. Oops, city there we go. And departments head. It, helps, it helps them stay focused and understand where they are on a page. So I'll keep using the H key here. Mayor's office heading, city council heading level three, departments heading level three, trial support and safety heading level two. So that's nice. I can use headings. OK, I'm getting the idea of this page, but I want to see everything. I want to know what are the links on the page? What are the buttons on the page? So now I'm going to open the, the menu. And again, I'm going to use a shortcut key. So on my keyboard, that would be insert FN and F3. 
City of Minneapolis dash Google Chrome virtual HTML features dialogue list one list view anchors list one. So what we see here is uh, the H. This is the the master menu basically. So from this menu, I can decide. Hmm. Let's see. I articles list two block quotes list buttons list four of twenty one. Am I only interested in hearing the buttons? Uh, I know um, uh, colleagues of mine who are native screen reader users, they're interested in headings and links a lot of times um, to help them jump through the page. Like they don't come to websites necessarily for fun. They're interested in getting the information they need so they can pay a bill, learn where to go to, you know, take their hazardous waste to or whatever. And so they're trying to, to as move through a site as efficiently as possible to get the information they need. And opening these this master menu is a way to quickly do that. So let's see here. Let's go to let's go to links. How about that? Check controls left divisions edit frame craft headings list 12 of 21. I'm just using the down arrow key here. Links list 13 of 21. Enter. City of Minneapolis dash Google Chrome links list dialogue links list view all departments 23 of so this is the master list of links on this page and it starts me from it looks like uh, the section I'm I'm at explore this section data source visualizations and dashboards crime maps and dashboards property information 27 of 55 city maps and applications Twen open data portal so this is all the links on the page and if we go up to the top here you'll see the navigation is included so let me just going to rapidly go to the top Artist. Resident Minneapolis City of Lakes logo, resident services, business services, things to do, getting around. So for folks who have, um, so, so menus, navigation menus tend to be very difficult and the experience is not necessarily consistent across every website. So a lot of times what folks will do, they'll just like skip using the navigation in the menu, they'll open this master list and they'll navigate that way. So it's kind of a way of um, not having to necessarily learn every about every new website that they go to uh, but still being able to get the information they want and this is why it's critical when you're writing link text to avoid text like learn more click here because if somebody has decided i need to move quickly and efficiently here i'm just going to go right to the links list and we'll, all they see here is learn more learn more learn more they aren't going to be able to navigate the site. They will not be able to find what they're looking for based on the link text alone. And so then they're going to have to do, they're going to have to take a little bit longer. So they're going to have to go through headings, listen to paragraphs of content, then get to the link so they understand, okay, this click here or learn more button is related to this content and this is what I want or this isn't what I want. But they had to listen to a paragraph of text before they realized the link wasn't what they wanted. So this is the importance of, of unique link text to help users move through the site. So for example, Govern, move Minneapolis forward, see how you're improving public safety and the lives of people affected by COVID-19. Like that's a very, that's a very descriptive link text. Participate in community, find COVID-19, watch city council TV, Mayor Jacob Free, set contact the mayor. Eight, so those those are descriptive links. It's very clear what they're going to do, and it's it's very helpful um, helpful for folks. So that was that was the last demo thing that I wanted to show you. So I will stop sharing now. Hopefully you can still see me. So the other good, Karen's nodding. The other thing I wanted to share with you all is um, some things to keep in mind. My time is on, I've got a timer here, Tana. So my time is almost up here, but I wanted to share a couple of other, couple other things to keep in mind. Um, translation. Oh, good call. Uh, translation is hugely important. Um, at Twitter, it's a global company and the number, the largest user base of Twitter is not actually in the United States, it's in Japan. So the largest user base speaks Japanese, they read Japanese, uh, but the headquarter, the headquarters are in San Francisco. You know, I'm in St. Paul, uh, thankfully, but it's in, it's in the United States. And so you have people who are creating content, driving design in the United States for an audience that is most largely outside of the United States. And so how do we, Think about design, writing, 
from a global point of view when English is not necessarily the predominant language spoken by our customers. So for example, button text, link text, so button text, we'll start with that. So um, inside of a button, um, it's usually like a word or two, right? But they can be quite long. And when you think about translating that text into German, Spanish, uh, languages that have longer words, more words to say, you know, um, uh, sh shorter, shorter things, you can't have uh, a button text in English that's five words long because that's going to be, you know, like an entire, you know, that's like the entire width of of a page of a web page on on desktop. So we really have to be cognizant of being concise and being clear and as few words as possible. We need to use the right words, but uh, we need to keep it simple at the same time. So translation is huge, hugely important, um, especially as the demographics in the city of Minneapolis change. Um, I don't know what the demographics are specifically, like what is the the ratio of how many people speak English to Somali, Spanish, um, uh, uh, or, or um, MOOB, for example, but thinking about translation, thinking about how the site will be translated as you write content, create content, guide uh, residents through content, very, very important. I also want to bring up the correlation between race, socio socioeconomic position, and device usage. So there is a correlation um, between people of color and low income individuals tend to use Android devices more often. So working, working in big tech, um, often when there's a new feature coming out or updates are made, they're made on iPhones first. Uh, because honestly, because um, iPhone development is much easier. Um, Apple has made it very simple to design websites using you know, for for i devices or mac mac devices excuse me and for android it's much it's much harder and so it takes longer and so they often release features and updates on, on I, ios and mac first and android comes second and what ends up happening is those folks feel like second class citizens and they are treated that way by big tech um, i work at twitter and i can tell you this for a fact um, our, our customers always bring up, hey, you released this cool feature for iOS. I'm on Android. I can't. I can't use this. When do I get it? And it's and it's an issue. And part of accessibility is advocacy for marginalized marginalized communities. And um, if you include, if you are already part of a marginalized group, and you add disability to it, disability is a compounding factor for um, margin marginalization. So if you think about someone who's person of color they you know they're uh, a low-wage worker and they have a disability like these people have a steeper hill to climb than people who aren't who don't fit those don't check those boxes so think about the compounding impact of small defects small problems in your site they can make a huge difference to somebody who is a person of color who is on a device that has that receives less support and has a disability so think about that as you're as you're working through content um also, quickly at the note, here we go. Consider cognitive disabilities. Um, Dana mentioned that a little bit. Cognitive disabilities or invisible disabilities. So people who have reading disabilities, who maybe have anxiety, um, uh, mood disorders, autism, things like that that you can't necessarily see. And so somebody has a has a struggling with something, or they're reacting to something in a way where you're like, this is being really dramatic. Like that's not that's not fair. That's not fair and it's not appropriate. Um, folks ex have the experiences that they experience and the best thing we can do is to consider those experiences as much as possible in everything we do. You might be asking, how in the world do you design for people with anxiety? You keep things simple for one thing. You keep things simple. You organize your content in a very intuitive, um, uh, clear way, direct, you know, things like that. So there's so there's ways of, of considering those things. And, at, and as an accessibility content strategist, I will always advocate for more people with content backgrounds to get involved in accessibility. We need more people who are thinking about language, translation, uh, reading level, um, how things look on a page, uh, as far as, you know, is it overwhelming? Is there too much text here? How can we simplify it? Things like that. Um, um, they're, they're, they're hugely important. So 
Uh, I think that's my time. Thank you all for your attention today and the City of Minneapolis for inviting me to speak. I'll hand it over to Dana. Thank you so much, Amber. That's so incredibly valuable. Great perspective. Um, we let's take a couple couple minutes here um, to to share uh, or or respond to any questions that somebody may have at this at this time. Um, we will have a a larger Q and A at the end um, for for anybody who thinks this through after everybody's spoken and, and any questions that come out come up at the end of the session. But anything specific for Amber at this moment? Anything in the QA? Um, there's one comment. If you wanted to read over that. Unless you want me to read it out to you guys. Could you please? Yes. Um, an anonymous comment is um, I've been on a few other screen reader demos over the years and I've never heard the use case of a person that has dyslexia using a screen reader learning new things. Thanks for the insight. Awesome. Happy to happy to elevate that one. Great. And you, everybody will have time to um, reflect on this and we'll circle back to um, to questions again at the end here. Um, I see Karen is sharing already, so we can we can go to Karen with NCR. Uh, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so I just want to say, um, Amber, I, I love co-presenting with you. This is my first time meeting you, but you just hit on a bunch of the points that um, our department would absolutely highlight as well. Um, first and foremost, I just want to say um, when we talk about accessibility, we want to start with the people and their experience. I think Amber, you just did a great job at um, kind of walking people through what an, uh, an experience might be like if you were relying on um, assistive technology to access our website. Um, I have a quote here from Alice Wong, who is a disability activist. Um, and I, I think I'm going to skip over it. I was going to read it, but I think I might skip ahead a little bit um, uh, and talk a little bit more in depth about a couple of these, these talking points. But um, the PowerPoint will be available if anyone is interested. Otherwise, I would really highly recommend checking out Alice Wong um, and her book, Disability Visibility. Um, after centering people and their experience, uh, I would also just acknowledge that there are some rules and regulations um, that require accessibility and starting with the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which is a federal civil rights legislation, which assured uh, that people with disabilities cannot be discriminated against. And as well, to, it assured reasonable accommodations for people with disabilities. Um, following up from that, the city of Minneapolis created an ADA action plan and passed that in 2015. And that was really what the city's responsibility was to assure accessibility coming um, aligned with the ADA Act um, and then as well as the implementation. And I want to acknowledge that in 2015 when the city passed our action plan, um, many action plans at that point were really looking just at the physical infrastructure and the city of Minneapolis is actually included um, a commitment to addressing accessibility through our digital and web-based infrastructure as well as investing resources in that. Um, I think for our department, both in 2015 and today, I think um, what our commitment is, is to look at above and beyond the minimum standards. So really looking above and beyond just those reasonable accommodations and really thinking, um, centering people in their experience and really what is our commitment to assuring accessibility for everybody in the city. With that, I want to I want to call out just a couple key components and I um, I want to give credit to Upstream Arts, which is a local organization that does uh, creative work and um, advocacy with folks with disability and acknowledge that access is an attitude. So 
addressing the physical infrastructure is a necessity, but that doesn't matter if people do not feel welcome when they enter the space. And when we talk about entering space, it could be the physical infrastructure, but I think as well, we just walk through an experience where we also understand that entering our web-based space, also there is a feeling that we create with that. And so are we assuring that we are welcoming all of our residents into that space? Um, they also highlight, and this is a something I take to heart and try to remind myself on a regular basis, is that accessibility and inclusion happens in ordinary moments and it really does require a consistent and intentional practice. And Amber actually highlighted one of our um, one of our big requests from NCR and all of our work, which is to think about accessibility early and probably a lot earlier than you would ex expect yourself to have to think about it. Um, because if you really are centering people in their experience from the very beginning, how the, your decision making proceeds may be different if you think about accessibility on the back end especially when it comes to things like translation interpretation services. Um, when we think about accessibility, I think we uh, we actually just walked through a great example of things like assuring access to information and services. Certainly as city government, that's something that we're committed to. Um, I think we also want to make sure that people have the ability to participate civically fully um, and what that means. And then we also like to include in their employment and assuring that um, everybody has access to employment. Amber also pointed out and used the same terminology we use, which is um, our community of folks with disabilities is made up of people with visible disabilities as well as people with invisible disabilities. And more likely than not, you have someone in your family, someone in your community, someone that you're sitting next to that has an invisible disability that you may never have known about, but certainly is something that they, uh, they that impacts how they access information. Um, I also feel obliged to kind of acknowledge that when we talk about accessibility, I think um, that in 2020, I think that we had the opportunity to think differently about what some of the constraints were on us as an employer, and certainly us as City of Minneapolis and government employees about what it, mean, what it meant to provide information and services in ways that were accessible what it meant to provide opportunities for all residents to participate civically, and what it meant to assure that everyone had access to employment. And um, I think we have an opportunity to think about building a new future and maybe thinking about were some of those constraints that existed before true constraints, or do we have an opportunity maybe to think differently? Um, and maybe uh, I might even suggest that some of those constraints were genuinely false. I think in particular, when we think about um, employment and some of the constraints that we've placed on ourselves, I think 2020 um, demonstrated to us that maybe maybe some of those were not quite true. Um, Neighborhood and Community Relations is here today because we actually house the ADA Title II coordinator. We have two certified Title II coordinators in our city and um, they provide, they can provide some technical assistance. Um, certainly if there are complaints that are coming in, they are available to review those complaints. Um, we also work with folks uh, formally through the Minneapolis Advisory Council on People with Disabilities. We also work with other state councils and other government entities that work on um, engaging people with disabilities and assuring that um, our services and our engagement processes and information that we share is accessible to folks. I would really encourage, again, as Amber said, to think about if you're working on anything, to reach out early and um, you can reach out through our department to uh, attend that advisory council and ask for input or partner. Um, and certainly if you don't reach out and that advisory council finds out that you are working on something um, that impacts them, you might get an invitation from them to come <laughs> and present. Um, our department also offers language access services along with the ADA Action Plan. We also house the language access plan, which assures access to information in various languages. Um, you can access us through City Talk, which I will show in just a quick moment. And then we do consultation and occasionally um, assist with implementation. So if you are trying to design something, a program that is rolling out, if you're trying to design an application form or an engagement process, I would encourage you to reach out early. Um, we 
will provide consultation and as Amber suggested, even help you think about structuring those things on the front end so that when it gets time to being released on the website or the need to be translated, it's designed from the beginning with that in mind. Um, as I said, you can access us through the City Talk website. Here's our page and you can see um, the on the top row there, language access services. That's how you could submit a request through the portal for assistance with interpretation or translation services. And then on the top right hand corner, you see accessibility square. Um, and if you click on that, that will bring you to our accessibility page, which has some information and some resources. And then lastly, Nick No is um, one of our two ADA project coordinators, and he is also the ADA language access coordinator for the city. So he manages all of that body of work. Um, you can reach out to him through the portal by submitting a request, but if you are just at the beginning stage of figuring something out and want to talk to him about what role we could play, certainly feel free to reach out to him directly. And with that, my presentation is done. So we will so we'll have, have an opportunity for questions with both Karen and Lynn here uh, regarding what we're doing here at the city. Um, Lynn is going to address uh, the tools that we have available and what we're doing uh, here at the city to ensure um, the city of Minneapolis content is more accessible to, to all users. Hey everybody. Taking a moment to share my screen. Apparently I'm having technical difficulties. One second, please. Here we go. Thanks everybody. Due to a limited amount of time, I'm just going to talk briefly to the slides and then I'd like to give you a demonstration. So as we've all touched upon, it's very important to make our digital content accessible in a variety of ways. There are many tools that we can use that I'd like to share with you today. We also have many resources available. We have the city's accessibility uh, page on our public website. We have City Talk web area, and I can't encourage you enough to take the writing for the web class. So with that, here's an example where we have a web page on our transition site, WW2, for our victim witness specialist. And we are in the process of transforming it and putting it on the new website. So first thing you can do in this journey is to go to our public website accessibility page and refresh yourself with some of the resources, the types of disabilities, and the guidelines that we at the city incorporate to help us have accessible content. Also on the city talk slash web, there is a page for accessibility resources. Once you're familiar with that, what we encourage you to do is use this free Hemingway app and take the text that's on the web page and paste it in the Hemingway app. You can see from this online tool that this text is grade 10. We aim for grade eight to nine on our public website, but more than just the readability, the grade level, we need to look at these other factors as well. Are the sentences um, hard to read? Is it passive voice? You know, is there a simpler alternative? So this takes quite a bit of time. There's some good tips here. We've used bulleted lists. We can see there are run-on sentences, there's very long sentences. So at this time, you can go ahead and improve the content here as well. 
There's another online tool that we can use, and this is called the Wave Evaluation Tool. It's an extension for Chrome, and I've gone ahead and queued up the new page that we've designed, and I have put it through the Wave format. So once this loads up, you will see how it's processed it. I'm not sure if it'll work through. Uh, it looks like it's not totally working when I'm displaying it. All right, we can try it again. The joys of a live demo. So you can see how we've improved the page. We've added an image. We've added bulleted lists. We'll try this one more time and see if it will work when I'm demonstrating. It's taking me to it. My apologies. Doesn't seem to be want to work when I'm in presentation mode today. What it did highlight for me was it showed me that this was a heading six. One of the things we want with accessibility is we want to go from an H1 to an H2 and we want to go in order. It showed us that this was an H6. So we would want to go ahead and correct that because accessibility tells us that we should all go in order. Let's see if I can bring up this example for you. So this isn't the best display, but you can see that this is what it did show earlier when I was preparing. This is what the wave evaluation tool will look like. And it shows us here's an issue here. It was an H6, so we would want to fix that so we go from H1, H2 to H3, as uh, Amber indicated earlier. The other thing that you can do is after your page is published, you can also use Site Improve. So when I went and logged into Site Improve, I went to the attorney group. On the dashboard, you will see the readability score for all of the pages in the attorney dashboard group. If I go to quality assurance and then I go to readability and I go to pages, I can drill in exactly and go to the page that I'm interested in looking at. The page that we had on WW2 was the victim witness specialist. And if I click on that, I can get more information about the readability. What's nice about Site Improve is that it will tell me the long words that are used on the page and the unique long sentences. So this also is very helpful, just like uh, we can use the Hemingway before we publish it. After we publish this, we can, in addition to using Site Improve to fix our broken links and misspellings, we can also use that to address our long sentences. This is hard to read. It, it makes it less scannable. Plain language says a person should be able to read it on the first pass. So we would want to address that as well. And we can also look at what words are long words and can we simplify that? And that will also help with the scannability and reduce the reading level. If you are working with uh, subject matter experts, you can use Microsoft Word. Microsoft Word has a functionality to check the reading level as well. So if you are asking a subject matter expert to present content to you, you can ask them to type it up in Word. And if you go to File and you go to Options, you can go to the proofing and make sure this readability statistics is on. And if that's on and you go to Review, Spelling and Grammar, it will show you the readability results as well. So that's something you can share with the subject matter experts to check their content before it goes. Any questions about that? I'd be glad to answer as well. So those are some of the things that we do to help 
people uh, when they are presenting and preparing content for public information. I put additional slides in the deck for when we share it out with you. So um, I will include those, some of those things that you know, tools and examples and so forth afterwards. But I know our time was limited and I was at the end, so I didn't want to use all that time. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lynn. Um, do we have questions for Karen and Lynn about the work that we're doing here at the City of Minneapolis? Colette, anything in the Q&A? Um, yeah, it looks like Karen is answering those questions. Um, let me go from the first one. Um, Kevin asked, what are the most common accessibility barriers that users face on sites and what is considered an especially frustrating one in particular? Um, the response, it's, it looks like it's still um, being answered. Ironically, the most common ones are often quite easy to fix. Giving a role value to elements is a big one. For example, labeling a button as a button, labeling a checks box as a checks box, etc. A few more, not using headings to organize content, writing at a post grade level, in the average grade level, reading level of Americans is eighth grade, retrofitting accessibility hacks after an experience has been designed instead of incorporating needs during the planning and design phases. Um, more captions for audio and video content, um, reading over. Um, let's see what else we got. Another question for Karen was, is there a city standard for information that should always be or should sometimes be slash or does not need to be translated? It's always a question of what should be translated, translated given time and staff constraints. Karen says it depends. People in our department can be available to assist with the decision making process, but it really depends on what is trying to be achieved, who will be impacted, and what is a meaningful way to communicate information. I would suggest that you reach out to NCR through the engagement portal early on, and we can walk through that with you. So those are the um, questions. Are there any more? Go ahead and ask Thank them. Thank you. Yeah, and let's let's take this moment to bring in any questions uh, that last chance to engage with Amber as well. If there are any any last questions um, after hearing everybody speak today. Well, this is this has been a a topic near and dear to all of us here at the city and, and on our teams. Um, we really work to ensure that we are addressing um, accessibility uh, in the work we do every day and, and every bit of our work. Um, no matter what it is uh, from from the simple to complex and and hope that uh, this information has brought something to you um, to impact the work that you're doing on a daily basis as well. Um, we, we love this quote here and and hope it inspires you the way it inspires us. Thank you for your time today. <laughs>